So I invite you to come back in time with me. It is a Friday night, and it's a beautiful Friday night, and it's a special Friday night. It's a date night with my wife, Ariana. And we're in beautiful Burlington, Vermont, and we're downtown, street musicians outside playing on the street, on this nice uh, street called Church Street, nice pedestrian street. And we're at our favorite restaurant called Lunig's, which is right on the corner. You have Church Street and you have College Street, and Lunig's is right there, an, an old world bistro cafe, very romantic spot. It's beautiful. And we're at our table, and nice white tablecloth, and we have a glass of red wine there, a glass of red wine here, our bread basket right here in the middle. And then the, the, uh, the people are walking outside, and it's just a beautiful night. And then I, I look up and I hear my wife talking to me and she says, have you heard a word that I've said? It's like your body's here, but you're not. Where are you? And, and I was totally, absolutely busted. I had so much on my mind that I couldn't pay attention in this nice, beautiful, wonderful night with my wife. And I don't think my journey to this point is all that unusual. As a matter of fact, I think we've all probably made a journey where you go from a single person and then you find a love interest and then you become an engaged person and then you become a married person. And then you become a person with a lot of little people running around. So it's hard to you know, find the time. Simultaneously, we may have climbed the ladder of our career. You had your first job, you did a good job at that, you got your second job, you got your third job, you got your fourth job. So here you are sitting at a table like this, wondering what the heck is going on and how am I gonna manage it all? Well, it was during this time of overwhelm that I found my mentor. Uh, his name is David Allen, fellow TEDx speaker. And he wrote a beautiful book called Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. And one of the quotes from that book is, your brains for having ideas, not holding them. And it's so interesting that that evening led me on this incredible journey. A few years later, David invited me to uh, join his company, run his company for him as the president and CEO. But more important than that, I got the opportunity to play the role as a coach, a trainer, and a speaker, and work with thousands of people across different kinds of industries. So I got to work with rocket scientists, I got to work with neuroscientists, I got to work with moms, I got to work with dads, I got to work with students, I got to work with clergy, I got to work with nonprofit organizations, and all these people were beautiful, beautiful people. And what I found was, I was not alone. As a matter of fact, we're all kind of alone in this together, this feeling. So it was very humble, it was very human to see that after this journey. But there's something else that started entering the picture as our, our lives evolved and as technology evolved. A little bit of Pandora's box in our pocket. So here is what I'm observing and experiencing at, at certain points of time where you have this wonderful tool in your pocket called a mobile phone. Now, it can both bring you joy because you can do all these wonderful things like play words with friends and, and search and, and make communication and get communication from folks. But what I'm seeing is it can also cause pain because now the world has access to you, and as a result of that, are you ever off or are you always on? So it's a very interesting thing. But it's not 100% your fault. You see, your brain is being tricked by design. And one of our contemporary um, folks, Seth Godin, I think sums it up really well. He says, trust and attention these are the scarce items in a post-scarcity world. So when you have access to everything and everybody has access to you, where are we suffering the most? Probably trust and attention, and how do we maintain that? 
So what created the conditions for us to have our brains tricked? Uh, the Deloitte uh, Consulting Group recently uh, released a survey, and do you realize that on average, we pull our phone out of our pockets 40 times a day? Now, I don't even do 40 push-ups a day. I imagine if I did 40 push-ups a day, it would be fantastic, and I'd be a little bigger than I am now. But 40 times a day, we pull the phones out of our pocket. Now. 10 to uh, about 10% of us pull our phones out of our pocket about 100 times a day. And you know who you are, and there's nothing wrong with that. It just is. Now, if our brains are being tricked by design, who are the tricksters in this? There's, there are a, a group of folks behind the phone that are creating these wonderful phonescapes for us. And you go to your phone and you see this wonderful, beautiful screen. And it's got you charmed and it calls you back all the time. Right? But charm, that's an interesting world. It's just another word for being tricked. So how are they charming us and who's doing the charming? So behind each one of these beautiful little squares on your phone is a group of tricksters. And they're just like you and I, really bright, intelligent people. They're the computer programmers. They're the designers. They're the business strategists. Their sole purpose is to congregate every day and say, how can I get you to look at my app more often? And they have meetings, and they have scrums, and they daily, daily, daily are thinking about that. Now, multiply that times all the pieces of real estate on your phone, and you've got quite a bit of, of uh, competition for your attention. So it's a jungle out there. There's literally a jungle out there that you have to go through every time you pull your phone out of your pocket. But what are they actually doing? What are they doing to us? So some of the tricks that they're pulling are very, very interesting. And they actually tap into our nervous system. So our nervous system uh, is something that with badges, sounds, notification, buzzing, lights, lights up all our sensory uh, neural pathways. And every time you go to an application and you look at it, it lays down a neural pathway. And the more you go there, the stronger the neural pathway gets. As a matter of fact, if you go back and back and back again, you probably even get a shot of dopamine that says, wow, that felt really, really good. Come on back. Come on back next time to check your email. And just do it randomly, and I'll give you another shot of dopamine. So it's kind of interesting that we enter this jungle, and there's a part of our brain when we go to this jungle that is just like we're back in the jungle. Our brains were designed to notice little twitches, and behind those twitches, it's either food or we're food. So it really, really plays on that part of our brain. Now, the other interesting thing is also in this jungle, if you take a look at the American uh, Psychology Association report, 62% of us go to some place, some kind of screen space to manage our stress. So in the same place where we go to do our productive work, we also go there to escape. So when we go to the phone, what are we going to do? Are we going to be productive or are we going to escape? It's all sitting there right in front of us, and we have to make some of those decisions. Now, this is a jungle, but there is a way out. So what I'd like you to do just for a moment is look at this screen. Just ponder it just for a second. Just look at it. Notice how your brain feels. Now, look at this screen. Notice how your brain feels now. What if, by design, we could take a little slice of whatever you're feeling now, and I bet it's a little calmer than the situation before. What if we could take a little slice of that and grab it and make it our own? What would happen if we took that slice and actually did 
three things. One, make that little slice of your own personal paradise. Whatever photo you find inspiring, grab it and set it as, as your home screen. Number two, take the jungle that you have to go through every time, 40 times a day when you open up your phone and move the jungle to your second screen. And then third, go in and turn off all your notifications and then go back and turn on as many as you need and as few as you can get by with. What might that leave you with? Here you now have a device that's in your pocket that becomes just a space to be before you choose to engage. How many people could use a little space before engaging? How many people have ever gone to your phone to do one thing, 20 minutes later, you still haven't done the thing that you wanted to do, <laughs> right? So this is just a micro space to engage. So, calm by design. It's in your power, it's in your control. It's something that is, is, is available to us right now. So what I invite you to do is try the test. See if it works for you. And then perhaps, perhaps that space that you created would create space for you to be available to that next creative idea that's waiting for you out there. Perhaps it's there waiting for you so you can play with your children just a little more. Perhaps it's there so that haze of overwhelm that's in your eyes can be replaced by the twinkle in your eyes of expectation, of loving, of paying attention to the one that you love. And perhaps my next date night can be romantic and filled with paying attention to the people that I love in the moments that are created when we create them. Thank you.